Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001 when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India an Indian perspective on Africa given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region so we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age what we're seeing much much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal India Quarterly is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future. Good morning ladies and gentlemen. On the behalf of the Indian Council of World Affairs, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the one-day webinar Advancing Reformed Multilateralism in the Changing World to revisit and reflect on the evolution and future of India's multilateralism, ICWA has taken this opportunity of bringing together eminent scholars, academics, and practitioners from across our country. 
Over the course of the day, we aim to discuss various facets of India's approach to multilateral institutions, agenda and processes, and the opportunities and challenges facing India in realizing its vision of reformed and reinvigorated multilateral system. I take this opportunity to welcome our distinguished participants and our august audience who have graciously accepted our invitation to attend the webinar. May I now request Dr. T.C. Raghavan, Director General, ICWA, to kindly deliver his welcome remarks. <coughs> Sir, please. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee, uh, who is chairing the, the first session immediately after this uh, opening, brief opening inaugural. Uh, Ambassador uh, Manjeev Singh Puri, uh, Dr. Rajput uh, and Professor Tasneem Minai, a very good morning and thank you very much for joining us uh, Today, I'm very happy to see a number of other participants who will be participating in other sessions uh, uh, also here. And I can see uh, Professor Umu Salma Bawa and uh, Dr. Arvind Gupta on the screen, but there are many others. Uh, uh, thank you all very much for joining us uh, in this uh, virtual discussion uh, on advancing reformed multilateralism in a changing world. Uh, I'm sure all of you will agree that th in many ways this is a seminal moment for the future of multilateralism. The UN has just completed 75 years. The shorter-lived League of Nations was founded almost a century ago and its catastrophic failure remains as a background in any discussion of multilateralism at a time of global geopolitical shift. The ongoing global power shift and a once in a century global health and economic crisis precipitated by the COVID-19 pandemic has created unprecedented uncertainty and ferment, leading states to put greater premium on sovereignty and domestic capa capacity rather than search for multilateral solutions. The trend in recent decades of drift and fragmentation in multilateral approaches in world politics has led some scholars to observe that if the second half of the 20th century was the age of integration of nations coming together in pursuit of common goals, the, 20th, the 21st century looks increasingly as an age of drifting apart. A contrarian view to this thesis obviously also exists. But what is clear is that old multilateral institutions, the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank and others are competing with other modes of governance. These include less formal uh, mechanisms such as the G20 and other coalitions and also very, very strong regional organizations. The 75th anniversary of the UN as also the centenary of the League of Nations two organizations in which India was an original founding member, provide an opportune moment to not only examine historical perspectives on India's engagement with multilateralism, but also take a hard and honest look at the structural weaknesses afflicting multilateral institutions, including the UN. At a virtual global summit marking the anniversary of the UN, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had made a strong pitch for preserving and strengthening the global multilateral system through reforms. He reiterated India's long-standing position that, quote, multilateralism needs to re represent the reality of the contemporary world. Only reformed multilateralism with a reformed UN at its center can meet the aspirations of humanity, unquote. Similarly, the External Affairs Minister, Subramaniam Jaishankar, had earlier stated that a new orientation for a reformed multilateral system would be India's overall objective. As India, for the eighth time, joins the UN Security Council as an elected non-permanent member, a new orientation for a reformed multilateral system 
will certainly constitute one part of its overarching mission. It is in this backdrop that this ICWA conference seeks to revisit and reflect on the evolution of India's multilateralism, its approach to multilateral institutions, agenda and processes, and also discuss the opportunities and challenges facing India in realizing its vision of reformed and reinvigorated multi of a reformed and reinvigorated multilateral system in the post-COVID world. Uh, I'm again would like to reiterate uh, the thanks of the Council to all the participants and to many others who are joining us to listen uh, into this uh, debate. I will now hand over to Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee, former Ambassador of India to the United Nations, uh, to chair the first session in which we will have Ambassador M. S. Puri, former Ambassador of India to Nepal and to the EU, as also a former Deputy Permanent Representative to the, to the United Nations, Dr. Rajput, who is a member of the International Law Commission and also part of our Governing Council in the ICWA, and Professor Tasneem Minai from the Jamia Millia Islamia. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, may I request now Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee and Dr. Deepika Saraswat to take over. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, sir, for your welcome remarks. Before we begin uh, our first session, uh, let me take this opportunity to uh, mention some house rules for the benefit of our panelists. All speakers and panelists are requested to mute themselves when not speaking. Questions will be taken during Q&A session. Panelists are, can ask questions to speakers through live, uh, through raise hand options. Questions can also be asked by registered attendees live by typing through chat box. These will be visible to all the panelists. Questions may be kept brief and to the point. In case uh, panelists are facing connectivity issues, uh, they may uh, switch off the camera and continue on the audio mode. I would now request uh, Chair Ambassador Mukherjee uh, to kindly conduct the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Deepika. I hope that uh, you can hear me and uh, see me. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the Distinguished Director General of the ICWA, Dr. T.C.A. Raghavan and his colleagues for organizing this event. The ICWA has probably been the only think tank in India that has actively organized events related to the 100 years of multilateralism and the 75th anniversary of the United Nations in order to offer suggestions to policymakers on the way ahead for India. This, I think, becomes relevant on the eve of India beginning her eighth innings as an elected non-permanent member of the UN Security Council from 1st January 2021. Today is a special day in the multilateral calendar. On this day in 1948, the General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is widely considered as one of the major achievements of the United Nations. Today, the human rights pillar must lead the global response to the COVID pandemic ensuring equal rights in confronting and mitigating this global threat. For us in India, today has special meaning as it was due to an Indian delegate in the drafting process of the Universal Declaration, Hansa Mehta, that the concept of gender equality became an integral part of this document with Article 1 reading, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Before requesting our panelists to make their presentation, I would highlight some aspects of the topic of this session from my perspective to set a broad framework. India became an original member of the United Nations when the UN Charter Treaty was negotiated and adopted at the 1945 San Francisco Conference following the victory of the Allied Nations in the Second World War. The contribution of 2.5 million volunteer troops from India who fought as part of these victorious Allied armies in no small measure made India a uh, uh, have a role as a founder of the uh, modern UN multilateral system. This was a continuation of the contribution of 1.3 million volunteer troops from India that played a major role in the Allied victory in the First World War, which resulted in India uh, founding the League of Nations by signing the Treaty of Versailles on 28 June 1919. Having contributed through such valor and sacrifice and being the largest democracy in the world today, 
India must be an involved stakeholder in the effective functioning of the UN and its network of institutions. India's experience during these seven decades emphasizes the importance of the principles of the UN Charter, including the rights and obligations of member states, as well as our common future for progress and prosperity. I think this is central to the call for reformed multilateralism today. India's independence from colonial rule in August 1947 has played a significant role in giving a new orientation to the original concept of the United Nations negotiated between the four major powers uh, between 1942 and 1945. If the vision of those four major powers, which were the Republic of China, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom and the United States, who sponsored the San Francisco Conference in 1945, gave primacy to regulating international relations through policing the world, India's independence injected into this vision two important dimensions. The first dimension was the importance of effective and equal participation and decision making by the UN and its structures. The provision of Article 18 of the UN Charter, which gives each member state in the General Assembly one vote, was given life by uh, the successful campaign spearheaded by India of decolonization between 1947 and 1960. The unanimous adoption of the decolonization resolution in December 1960 ensured not only the democratization of international relations in the General Assembly, but also the first major outcome, which was the first and only reform of the UN Security Council in December 1963, through a resolution amending the UN Charter by a two-third majority vote. Despite the opposition of four of the five permanent members to this resolution, the fact that all of them subsequently set aside their hidden veto contained in Article 108 of the Charter must continue to give us hope for completing the process of UN Security Council reform sooner rather than later. The second dimension of India's contribution in the past 75 years has been to make development, which has converged with environmental protection into the concept of sustainable development, the central agenda of the United Nations today. This process was similarly influenced by the democratization of international relations, which made the platform created in 1964 of the Group of 77 Developing Countries, or G77, such an effective platform. The most significant outcome of this activity is symbolized by Agenda 2030 with its Sustainable Development Goals, showing that the perspective of what we call the Global South is more universal than that of the five major powers in the UN Security Council who seek to preserve the 1945 The reason we have been able to achieve these successes has been our ability to integrate a multiple stakeholder approach into multilateral activities. In his three major addresses to the United Nations this year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has underlined the importance of what he called, and I quote, a whole of society, society unquote, people-centric paradigm, which ensures that nobody is left behind. This is true today of Agenda 2030 on Sustainable Development, as it is for the UN's Tunis Agenda, which regulates the emerging domain of cyberspace. The preamble to Agenda 2030, adopted unanimously in September 2015, emphasizes the interlinkage between peace, security, and development in giving mankind a universal roadmap for progress. Therefore, when looking at the relationship of India with the United Nations today, we must emphasize this forcefully as the primary reason for India's call for reform multilateralism. And that brings me to the concluding part of my remarks today. Those of us who heard Prime Minister Narendra Modi speak at the General Assembly on 26 September this year was struck by the impassioned way he highlighted the human cost of the breakdown of international peace and security while acknowledging the positive contributions made by the United Nations during these past 75 years. His call for reform multilateralism focused on the responses, processes and character of the United Nations. At its heart, the call for reform multilateralism is a call to complete the process of democratization of international relations which means, essentially, the reform of the UN Security Council as agreed unanimously by the UN Summit of 2005. It is a glaring anomaly today that the Security Council continues to operate with the non-negotiated decision-making provisions of the 1945 Charter designed to arbitrarily block democratic decision-making, which is called the veto uh, privilege. 
This has happened even most recently when the international community sought to respond to global challenges like the current COVID pandemic. Since sustainable development requires a supportive external environment, the urgent need to reform this archaic provision of the UN Charter must become the foremost priority of all of us who are committed to effective and participatory multilateralism. How can this be achieved? I now turn to our panelists to share their thoughts. Ambassador Manjeev Puri's presentation will make a compelling case for why UN reforms cannot be put off for much longer. Dr. Anirudh Rajput will speak on India's contribution to international law at the United Nations, a significant area that demonstrates not only India's interest in contributing to the creation of a framework of international law, but also India's commitment to abide by the rule of law in international affairs. And our third panelist, Dr. Tasneem Minai, will speak on India's contribution to UN peacekeeping. Dr. Minai has rich experience on peace and conflict resolution with a focus on the humanitarian dimensions of conflict, which is the major challenge before UN peacekeepers, including more than 6,000 Indian troops on the ground today in 11 missions across the world. How can peacekeeping provide space for sustainable resolutions to ongoing conflicts on the agenda of the Security Council? Now, with these remarks, I now request Ambassador Manjeev Puri to share his views. Manjeev, you have the floor. Uh, please go ahead with your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Ambassador Mukherjee, the chair. Can you all hear me, please? And Deepika, have you got the presentation? Uh, I had a bit of a, a PowerPoint and I want to know, Deepika, have you? Got? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Director General, first of all, I want to compliment ICWA not only for the fact that you have focused on multilateralism, but it appears to me that you were among the people a couple of months back who knew how 80 million Americans were going to vote. So all the things that you said at the beginning that, you know, there are alternates, etc. I think for the moment, let's at least put a pause button, if not a semicolon or a full stop. You know, so much of all this that we've been hearing is as a result of, if I may use the expression, a petulant big boss. And that is exactly what you saw. So let me get myself focused quite clearly and straight away on issues which concern India and a bit, or should I say quite a lot to do with the changing world and the changing India in it. And if I may put it very uh, sort of bluntly, hard power issues. You know, much is said about the fact that the UN is silent on COVID-19. Of course, it's not silent. The main body in the world which is talking about it, including the United States for the first time having to take UN tests approved, etc., is the WHO. That's also the UN. Security Council. Why is it so important? In fact, we have consistently opposed the Security Council getting into issues which are non-international peace and security. But I'll come to why the reform of the Security Council is central to globalization very quickly. You know, the UN in many matters was quagmired in its first three, four decades with the G2, the USSR and the United States sort of um, squaring off against each other. And let me make the point to you, the strongest sort of regional organization the world has seen was NATO. And yet the UN survived very well, doing very well. It invented peacekeeping. It did very well in issues dealing with human endeavor. What is the real change? You know, the UN has not been multilateral. Right from the very beginning, a slight change from the League of Nations, which allowed that unanimous kind of voting business extended to a very large number. This was a place where there was multipolarity built into the system, good or bad. That is how the system was done. What has been the real change in the last few years? The real change is that for the first time, someone from the have-nots of the world, in the real sense of the world, not the fact that the United States grandfathered China to become a member of the P5. A real sense of the world, there is a challenge to Western hegemon. The largest economy in the world in PPP terms and the second largest in the real since the market uh, prices terms, is China and rising. And this 
is something which is a matter which is certainly having its impact even at the United uh, Nations, particularly because the United States itself was withdrawing from its leadership role. If it takes that, it can take that forward. Look at the changes that we are looking at. How are we going to negotiate action on climate change? How are we going to negotiate action on pandemics? This is the need. You know, the genie of globalization is out of the bottle. It's not going back. You can try and say we should curb it, lower the pace, this, that, but it ain't going back. My point is very simple. The United Nations is needed. Neither regional organizations nor coalitions of the willing. The G20, in fact, became truly effective only when it roped in the IMF on the SDRs issue. That is how it became truly global and action started taking place. And when it starts doing something about the changed world. Now, I have just a few minutes of so what I'm going to do and try and focus myself on a simple matter. The United Nations ain't broke. It is needed, but it needs to be fixed through reforms. And I want to make a distinction between reforms and not the subject of improvement, which should be an ongoing matter and not the question of dismantling and we'll do it otherwise. I don't think we are in a position to do it otherwise. Deepika, let's move forward. In 1945, as Ambassador Mukherjee pointed out to you, there were 51 members, 11 Security Council members. One of them was China. How did China come there? I think it's a little story which is worth mentioning. The United States of America championed China, but it was the Republic of China. Unfortunately, within a few years, that retreated to a little island called Formosa. And in 1971, well, the world changed, reflecting contemporary reality. And the People's Republic of China found itself not only in the center, but grandfathered and a member of the P5. The rest, as they say, is history, and we are there today. What is the situation today? Only two of the P5 are in the top five global economies. And India is there today, a country which was not even independent in 1945. The global focus has moved away from being Eurocentric. Africa is coming in its own, in the real sense I'm saying so, because Latin America was important even in 1945. These are the kind of issues. Uh, uh, let's go further, Deepika. Let's take the next slide. Deepika, can we take the next slide? Okay. Uh, you know, why is the United Nations Security Council the key and what is the issue that we are talking about? Globalization and the global organization that was thought of a hundred years back and it was as a result of changes which had come about gradually. There were many international conferences before that, etc. Why is it that in all of this, we tend to focus ourselves on a simple matter and that is the reform of the Security Council. Can we see the next slide, please, Deepika? Yeah. Please note the following. The UN is at the heart of the global organization system. No matter the importance of the WHO, the importance of UNIDO, UNESCO, or even the importance of the World Bank, IMF on the one side, and the WTO. And what happens in the United Nations is worth noting. There are three articles which are particularly relevant and no one should lose sight of them. The first one is Article 25 which says that the resolutions or the decisions of the UN Security Council must be met by all member states. In a sense, they are international law. The UN General Assembly, on the other hand, is a best endeavor business. It is not binding. Secondly, is this issue of veto, which Ambassador Mukherjee just mentioned. And then comes something which is very important, which is Article 97, which is that the entire running of the system is based on what the United Nations Security Council will do, i.e. the Secretary General will be appointed on the recommendation of the Security Council. In effect, it means the Security Council will decide who will be the next Secretary General. The Secretary General is the all-important person running the UN. Now, the P5 may have a certain amount of hold on him, and they do, but by and large, the system operates that way. And it is that particular system which lets out ideas in the world. When we talk about sustainable development, when we talk of the Millennium Development Goal, incidentally, the MDGs is perhaps a very good example. They were not negotiated. 
They were Mr. the Secretary General's ideas. That many of us in the world liked them was a good idea. When it came to the Sustainable Development Goals, many of us in the developing world felt that we were not going to get what we wanted as the priority. And we insisted that these are negotiated in the General Assembly. And which is why when you look at the SDGs, primacy continues to be given to poverty alleviation, hunger, education, etc. Otherwise, the SDGs would have started and ended with climate change. These are facts that one needs to remember, which is why membership is the key issue. Can we go further, Deepika? Yeah. You know, Mr. Kofi Annan put out a very seminal report called In Larger Freedom in 2005. Fundamentally, it's one of the things, one of the templates which continues to remain and one on which we really need to act and we haven't acted for a long time. It mentions, of course, five facets of Security Council reform, including working methods, uh, regional representation, the veto. On the veto, I'll just make a simple point. Who's going to give it up? If you keep sticking to the idea that the veto should be changed, let me tell you, we might as well forget reform of the United Nations, reform of the system that is currently exists. And I'm not sure any of us are in that position, no matter the fact that it's only two out of the P5 who are part of the global five in the world. I think we need to understand that much of this is about incrementalism. It's about graduation. It's about taking things forward step at a time. And but moving in the right direction, that is why the word used is reform and not dismantling or improvement. Membership is the key issue. From membership flow many subjects and many matters. You know, I'll make a simple point to you. If countries who sit around the horseshoe table and those who have a certain amount of permanence in that particular place, their itself changes the manner in which the organization works. It not only changes things in a de facto manner, de jure also changes because there would be a change in the number of affirmative votes required. And I'm very happy to draw attention to a 2011 resolution of the UN Security Council 1973 on Libya, which came very close to not getting adopted purely because we might not have got the nine affirmative votes, even though no permanent member was voting against it. This is somewhat something similar to what Ambassador Mukherjee mentioned, that in 1963, four of the P5 were not willing. In fact, interestingly, the P5s who were willing to go ahead with this reform was the then Republic of China, because it saw itself defeated in election after election at the United Nations on bodies in which, you know, you required a majority. So this is the nature of the game. You know, policy space is very important to have. But to exercise it, well, that requires something a bit different. I am a very strong believer that if you fix this issue of membership of the Security Council and in particular the important issue of who will sit around the table with a sense of permanence, you will try and see a reformed and a better world which is compatible with our needs of today. I don't know what will happen 50 years from now, but today it would be a definite help to us and let things move. The G20 is a beautiful example in this. Why was the G20 constituted? Essentially, it was constituted because the West wanted in the fight against the recession of 2008 that you shouldn't leave out China. But they also brought in India. They also brought in the other largest developing countries. Why? Because the heft of all these countries matters. And it was important to be able to utilize all of this for the benefit of themselves too. Which is why the reform of the United Nations Security Council, in my opinion, is important and perhaps opportune. Because this is a time for those who are the haves there to solidify their own position. And this is a matter if we stress and put across in a proper and an appropriate manner. Of course, it's all politics. It is a matter in which forward movement is certainly possible. Deepika, next slide, please. What are the positions? I think everybody knows the general position. The big demanders of change are four countries, which is called the G4, India, Brazil, Germany and Japan. But let me tell you, through a great deal of diligence led principally by India, 
nearly 40 developing countries across the world have also formally demanded that there is expansion in the permanent membership of the Security Council. This, by the way, also includes small island developing states who have added their own request that there should be one seat earmarked for them. Fine. The Africans came aboard and in fact have started making strong demands only because there was the G4. Of course, their demands are a bit uh, more than what can be swallowed easily. It will have to be worked out and we'll have to find ways and means of even assuaging the Arabs. And who are the naysayers? Principally, the naysayers are of course the P5 at the moment. I think we should be quite clear about it. Because if the P5 came together, you would have reform tomorrow. There would be a top-down process. But the naysayers in the real terms, in the UN system, are the middling countries. Who are these countries? Pakistan, they don't want to see India there. Italy, they don't want to see Germany there. <clears throat> Mexico, they don't want to see Brazil. The South Koreans, they don't want to see the Japanese. These are the forces which drive them. And they have their own ideas in it. But basically because the buzzword is reform, they came up with the idea, let us reform by only extending the number of non-permanent members. Let me tell you, even that little reform, and we should certainly not settle for it, even that small little reform would mean changing the dynamic in the Security Council because it would invariably be accompanied by increasing the number of affirmative votes required for a resolution. Not so easy for anyone to pilot and champion his own idea. And then you have some small countries, Liechtenstein and so on, who are about, we should simply reform the way the Security Council works. Um, you know, the less one says about it, the better, because it's not a position which is really about global governance, global power play, etc. They are playing their own role. They have their own interests. For them, as things are, are fine. What they want is greater access, greater understanding. But of course, it all adds up to kinds of naysayers, but I dare say that they will come aboard. The P5. I think we should be very clear that while the Chinese are quite clear in articulating that this belongs to the victors of World War II, how they became victors of World War II, let's not talk about it. The fact is the Russians are the ones who have been quite clear and upfront in saying that they don't see any reason for reform. On the other hand, it is my contention that the Russians would be best suited by having a reform because the UN Security Council is the one place which cements their primacy in the global order. The Chinese have many other fora. Similarly, Britain and France who generally come out and support the G4 position, but quietly would certainly like to see it shelved, moved back, and so on and so forth. What about the United States, the key player in this game? Well, frankly, the answer is ambivalence. They haven't really made up their mind. Why haven't they made up their mind? Because, you know, till now, things were going their way. There wasn't much of a problem. They really didn't have to do anything. And are they happy with a G2 at the top of things? Maybe they are. We really have to work with them and we should not assume that they will automatically be in favor of a reform or an expansion in the permanent category. That's something we must understand and realize no matter how close bilateral relations tend to build up. Next slide, please. Yeah, so you know, uh, Ambassador Mukherjee pointed out to you that the seminal action happened in 2005, the 60th anniversary of the United Nations. At that time, reform of the Security Council was explicitly put down in the papers. I must say it was a disappointment to me that at the 75th commem uh, commemoration, we merely had words like install new life in the discussion on the reform of the Security Council. You know, we are the demandiers. We are the ones who have to push. Let us remember no one else is going to do it, no matter that the need of the hour is visible to everyone. What do we need for it? We need that the G4 has to be strong. India itself has to be very strong. And I am glad that we are now demanding that we move beyond the text which was circulated in 2015 by the United Nations General Assembly's President when Ambassador Mukherjee was our PR. That text has to be really made into a negotiating text. Now I want to make one big broad point to you. 
you know we must use all opportunity to articulate our world view on reform but we must remember that this kind of negotiations are long drawn out affairs requiring massive diligence and in the end political agreement when you build the political situation that things have to happen things do tend to happen i can give you the climate example it went on for many years and then in 2015 all that was remained was for everyone to get up and applause and we had the paris agreement what happened in 2016 is a different matter in fact 2016 is the year which icwa very presciently figured out that 2020 would overturn there was many things that happened at that time i think these are the facts which we remember but let us remember and deepika can we look at the next slide yeah you know essentially what we are working at the un at the moment is a bottoms up approach a text negotiate the text we'll whittle things down in the end we'll sit down and take some kind of a decision but you can of course have things top down in 2005 the g4 was very much taken in by a top down approach lay down some kind of a framework resolution on the number of countries required in the expansion and therefore go ahead and table it but many felt it was risky you could of course have a political consensus among the the bigs of the world somewhat reminiscent of 1945 except voted in the un general assembly but i want to make a simple point the un is a political animal it was created as a political act and in the end for its reform you will need political action and i dare say political compromise my own world view is that you should push push diligently push for the best but you should be prepared to settle for less than the maximum because it is very unlikely that you will get everything that you want it doesn't happen that way but if you have calibrated forward movements india is going to be a gainer and i very confident the world will be a gainer as a result of it i am very happy that the honorable prime minister has himself taken the lead of pushing india's case and the whole idea of un reform very strongly he said so extremely powerfully at the special session which was held to commemorate 75 years of the un and then speaking at the brics summit recently he made the same points change is the one thing which is constant change you must and you must reflect contemporary realities or you will be simply washed away this is particularly important i believe the situation is also opportune for india we are going to be on the security council we are hosting the brics summit next year and in 2023 the g20 summit at the end of the day as i mentioned this is a political act its actions will have to be political and so therefore when you have the opportunity of being together with the most important politically you can try and put your points across and then do things in such a manner that you take some risk but it is a measured risk and one that will take things forward thank you very much ladies and gentlemen thank you mr director general mr chairman thank you very much to you thank you uh, manjeev uh, that uh, was uh, in keeping with your Uh, reputation you have uh, really dealt with this topic in a very constructive forward looking manner and uh, it, it, and we will come back to it in our discussion uh, may i now request dr rajput uh, to make his presentation on india's contribution to the making of international law at the united nations dr rajput you have made a huge mark in the international law commission already uh, we would be very happy to hear your views today you have the floor Thank you, Ambassador Mukherjee. Thank you so much for your kind words. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this panel, and to be again under your chairmanship, and to have Ambassador Puri as a as a co-panelist on 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 such an interesting panel. Also, thanks to ICWA for organizing it for, and to its very active uh, Director General Ambassador Rakhwan. what i intend to do is i intend to look at india's contribution towards international law and how this can be a prism to look towards the future of un and un reforms at the multilateral level 
Ambassador Puri made a very passionate case about why India should be a permanent member of the Security Council. What I might have to say might sound not so interesting as it was in terms of what Ambassador Puri has to say, because international law is often ignored and more than that, misunderstood aspect of international relations. But what we can't forget, or the adage that I used to often hear when I was a child, is we won at wars and lost at the negotiation tables. And the reason why we lost at the negotiation tables is because we couldn't get what we want in concrete words. And that's what an international lawyer's job is. You might think you have won a seat in the Security Council, but unless you have the right words drafted into the UN Convention, your victory just might be not even a paper victory, but a fiction. Therefore, the job of international lawyer, the role of international law, cannot be undermined. What does happen with international law, quite unfortunately, is that we tend to forget its importance because international law is not just disabling, it is enabling as well. When I say enabling, I mean it allows you to do a certain things. And when I say disabling, it allows to you, allows you to stop others from doing certain things. Of course, it also restrains you from doing certain things. So there are these enabling and disabling aspects of international law, which have to be taken into account. The other preliminary point which I want to make before I turn to India's contribution to making international law at the United Nations is that international law is not politics. It is definitely an outcome of a political process like any other law. All laws that we have are passed by the parliament, which is a political process. Likewise, everything that becomes international law comes out from a political process. That does not mean international law is politics by itself. It is a set of technical rules, what we call a rule based international legal order. I would not get into the merits and different aspects of a rule based international legal order at the general level, because that would be outside my brief for today. But what I do want to do is to look at how India has contributed towards this process of a rule based international legal order. And I want to look at certain areas where India has made substantive contributions. These contributions, of course, have contributed towards the making of the law, but have also emphasized and put forward India's position as a leader of what was then the global south. And I think now India is moving towards not being just a leader of the global south, but a leader of the entire global scenario, a new set of international relations and it is going beyond its what may call the, the traditional constituency. In order to look at this contribution, I have, I have identified some areas where India has made major contributions. Now, as I said, these contributions emanate from a political process and they might result into two things. The first thing is a treaty, which is a negotiated document where the will of the state is expressed in fairly clear terms. But the second one, which has been absolutely ignored and often ignored in the global south, and which has been very effectively used by the Western world until now, and has been used for centuries, is the role of what is called customer international law. The rules of customer international law are not a part of a treaty, but they are nevertheless binding on states. And these rules of customer international law are created from the way in which a state behaves, the statements that a state makes. The way in which India has behaved, which means things that it thought it should perform as its obligation under international law, also expressed through various statements that the government of India has taken its official positions. And mind you, it's not just the position of the government of India, it's even the decisions of national courts that is Supreme Court, which contributes towards this process. But since we are looking at the UN, we don't have to get into what is the consequence of judicial decisions. And we can focus on statements of India and the way in which it has led to crystallization 
formation of rules of international law, particularly customary international law. The first point that comes to my mind or the first major area of international law where India's contribution is sterling is in the process of decolonization. The process of decolonization is quite an interesting exercise. Ambassador Puri in his slide showed us from 1945 to 1965, the number of members of the United Nations increased from 51 to 117. Today we stand at 193. So almost four times there is a fourfold increase in the number of states. This fourfold increase is an outcome of the process of decolonization. That is the Western powers who had colonized the, the, the global south had to leave their colonies and go back. Now this is quite an interesting and important aspect. Because of India's leadership in various resolutions which resulted into the decolonization process, it has strengthened India's relations with all these states who are today the members of the United States uh, of United Nations and a major supporting bloc of whatever India tries to do at the international level. It is quite interesting to note that in the 60s when India was pushing for the decolonization process, it was United Kingdom which was say, saying that we do have a right to perpetuate colonization even post uh, 1945 UN Charter, which is of course as a consequence of its own national interests. Of course, we should therefore not be too sanguine or too deferential towards our former colonial masters and realize that they have created system which suits them in the best possible manner. An associated point of, of decolonization is that of self-determination and most importantly, the scope of the right of self-determination. United Kingdom again and some of the Western powers have been trying to push for a broader right of self-determination. What I mean by broader right of self-determination means is these Western countries have been trying to say that there is something of what may be called a right of remedial secession. Remedial secession means a group of people within a country wanting to carve, carve out a different country for themselves. India has persistently opposed this interpretation and has presented what one might say a realistic understanding of self-determination, which is the state of the law today. Some time back, there was a big debate around Catalonia wanting to separate from Spain. And interestingly, what Spain was arguing was precisely what India has been trying to crystallize as the scope of right of self-determination. And that is today the rule of custom and international law, which is that the right of self-determination can be exercised only in a, colon in, in a colon colonial context that is in the process of decolonization. There is no right of remedial cessation. In fact, many states like India are multicultural, multi-religious societies. Simply by being a part of a group, it doesn't give you a right to carve out a country for yourself. That would be breaking up the membership of the United Nations and that would be disrupting the, uh, the, the, the balance of international relations. So we do see that right and concept of self-determination pretty much spread across the world and very much a part of contemporary international law as a part of contribution of India. The third major area of contribution, which also arises from, from the era of 60s and 70s, is the declaration on friendly relations between states and non-interference in internal affairs. Now, both these documents are declarations. There's been a long ranging fight within the United Nations between the Western world and this and the southern world, the global north and the global south, led by India, the fight essentially has been what is the value of activities happening in the General Assembly. Now, what happens in the Security Council, not all of it. So although Article 25 is important and states are supposed to carry out whatever Security Council says, but the international community is technically not bound unless it is a resolution under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, the debate was that the Western world was emphasizing that it is only the Security Council which is whose actions are binding. Therefore, it is the Security Council which in effect creates the law and whatever is done in the General Assembly is hortatory, advisory, has no legal value as such. 
But these two resolutions stand out because the International Court of Justice on two occasions in the Nicaragua case and thereafter in, in, in Congo, Uganda case, uh, armed activities case, the International Court of Justice declared both these documents to be rules of customary international law. That is something that came out of the General Assembly, but is nevertheless binding on all states. And today we do see a very regular use of both these re resolutions, more so by China, to say that please don't interfere in our internal affairs. I won't get much into details of these two documents, but these two documents are quite important and a very important manifestation of obligation of states, which do arise due to the contributions that India made in the process of making these of these two documents. An associated point is that of use of force. What flows from these two documents is that the states should not use force in, in their relations with each other. Of course, this flows from the, the mandate of the UN Charter Article 2.4, read with Article 51. But nevertheless, what is the scope of that use of force? We do see that the Western powers have been trying to expand the interpretation and meaning of that scope of use of force. Particularly in the, in the Kosovo crisis and thereafter, we did see that there was an effort on the part of particularly by United Kingdom and United States to offer the idea of uh, R2P, uh, the right to, to, to intervene on the, uh, on the basis of humanitarian intervention. Now, this so-called right of humanitarian intervention was thankfully very soon put out of its, its legal value by the President of the United States himself, Bill Clinton, who said that we R2P for us is purely a political tool. We interfere only if it is in our political interest thereby saying it is not a legal obligation. So in a sense, taking out the air of the argument which several people were then trying to make that R2P is some sort of an obligation on states to go out into another jurisdiction, use force and try to carve out small states from different existing countries of the United Nations. Just to keep us in mind that Kosovo did become an independent country thereafter, which was an outcome of a political process rather than any established legal doctrine. India's position of not to use R2P to expand the use scope of use of force is pretty much what we may call is the state of custom and international law and with which all states have to abide today. I have few minutes left and I'll quickly breeze through some of the points. Uh, there are major contributions in the law of the sea. I think that itself is a, is a huge topic where several things can be said. Uh, the way in which India pushed for 12 nautical miles because developed countries wanted to come close to the, uh, to, uh, to the territory so that they could spy. But India said, no, it has to be 12 nautical miles so that you don't come and interfere in our internal affairs. That was a big victory for the developing world and the entire developing world stood behind it. The way that India put for the 200 nautical miles uh, continental shelf, that's also there. Although under unclosed this, we don't have a specific recognition of the requirement that, sea, that ships passing through the territorial sea have to announce in advance, which India has been always asking for. Even if it is not a part of UNCLOS, it is certainly quite clearly a part of customary international law today because several states are asking and demanding these rights. The last limb, which I think I should have sp spent a little more energy, but nevertheless, I'll spend a few minutes on is what is being discussed today is, 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 is the Convention on Counterterrorism, the CCIT, and where do we stand and what is the future of it? What I spoke about was more about the history, but I think we need to look at it to understand that we have made substantive contributions towards the making of international law. And as we go towards the future, as our status in the international uh, domain enhances, our contribution has to accordingly increase. And what is at hand is, is really as the, as the, as the, the, the comprehensive convention on counterterrorism. We need to get into an assertive position as we have got in politically on matters of membership, permanent membership of the Security Council. On the legal field, we are still somehow skeptical. We are still pretty much on the fringes. We haven't got down of the fence, come into the middle of the battle, flexed our muscles and sought what we want. Of course, as, as Manjeev Puri, uh, Ambassador Puri said, we can't get everything that we want. We have to make trade-offs and we have to make some, uh, give up, make some compromises. But despite these compromises, it is quite possible to achieve what India expects. 
particularly in light of what's happening in the domain of counterterrorism. There are various aspects which one has to keep in mind as to what one wants to do. I started off by saying international law can be enabling, international law can be disabling. If we are contemplating a comprehensive convention on international terrorism, we need to ask ourselves whether we want an enabling legislation or we want a disabling legislation. Now, when I say enabling or disabling, the dichotomy represents the, the ability to assert a few things and not to be constrained by certain things which are unnecessary. What we do see happening at the negotiations is particularly the, particularly the OIC, Organization of Islamic Countries, is trying to expand the scope of the disabling provisions. Because the OIC is insisting on putting exceptions to definition of terrorism by saying that if terrorism is resorted to for overthrowing occupation, uh, for, uh, for, for for overthrowing col colonization, then terrorism would be a justified mean. But today we have a world where colonization has been finished. So one wonders whether we do we really need such kind of an exception to terrorism, particularly so by virtue of, of Security Council Resolution 1373 and many of those thereafter, which were an outcome of, uh, of, of the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack, these resolutions and even resolutions in the General Assembly right from the Lockerbie bombing as well have very clearly spelled out that come what may, terrorism is no justification. Killing of civilians cannot be justified in any garb. So now trying to insist that allow us to give us the freedom to kill civilians simply because we are running an anti-colonial or anti-oppressive or we are against an oppressive government is just it just it just doesn't fit fit the box of the contemporary international law doesn't fit the box of the contemporary human rights law we do speak of human rights a lot but i think we need to have a more nuanced approach rather than using it just as a tool for making noise and when i say that i think it's quite important to look at if we are looking at human rights it, there can be no justification of terrorism because it is the most blatant violation of human rights and it is the duty of a state to protect the life of its citizens. So any form of terrorism is contrary to human rights, is contrary to very basic norms of international humanitarian law. So any effort trying to narrow down the definition of terrorism by removing certain activities on the part of organization of Islamic countries or anybody else, apart from being in interest of certain countries, which probably we all know who they are, is simply unjustified in the international law, contemporary international law that we live in. Having said that, does it mean we should not move? And I think Ambassador Puri had a very nice message. We have to steer, keep moving. We might take time. The goals might be far off. Goal of, of on convention of terrorism is not that far off. We can achieve there. But as I said, we need to identify what we want to enable and what we want to disable. Now, areas of enabling could be areas of cooperation, mandatory cooperation between states on matters of terrorism. We, it's not that we don't have conventions on terrorism. There is a convention on terrorism financing. There is a convention which, which requires on, on aircraft bombings, on ship bombings. There's several of those hijackings. All those require mandatory cooperation between states, member states of those treaties. That could be a starting point. That could be a rallying point. And then one can move forward because states don't want their right to count or to, to act against terrorism under national law. So we also have to maintain that balance of discretion of tackling issues of terrorism under national law to protect their citizens. At the same time, having a greater cooperation among states on intelligence information so more in the form of a procedural text, that's what a future form of a convention on counterterrorism can take. Issues of definition could be addressed, left out, could be smartly de dealt with. That's how law develops. I'm quite pleased. I've gone way beyond my time. My apologies for that. But uh, I, I should congratulate the ICW for this event and thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That was uh, really uh, very, very fascinating. Uh, very little known aspect, but a fascinating account. And I'm sure that will get the appetite of our audience to know more.
now may I turn to our third speaker, uh, Dr. Tasneem Minai. Madam, you have 15 minutes. I'm not going to cut the time we will, uh, because I see from the chat that we have just three questions. So the audience is yet to warm up. So please do take yes. your 15 minutes and make your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair uh, Ambassador Ashok Mukherjee. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Raghavan, Director General of Indian Council of World Affairs, for inviting me as a panelist for this webinar on advanced reformed multilateralism in the changing world and giving me an opportunity to present my views on India's contribution for U UN peacekeeping. Uh, I would like to make a PowerPoint presentation. So if I could take a few seconds to just upload my PowerPoint, please. Yes. Ma'am, you were able to upload earlier and then you stopped sharing it. Please upload okay. again. Madam, now just uh, click the slideshow and we, it's there on the screen. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, As you could ma'am continue uh, without the presentation, we'll upload it for you if you can just quickly email me or something. Is it visible? Is it visible? No. It, it's gone off again, ma'am. It was visible. You had to put it on the uh, read screen. That's all. Uh, but uh, perhaps you could go ahead and, and make the presentation and uh, we will try and see what uh, we can do with the PowerPoint. Sorry. Use, use it from your screen. Uh, we will. Uh, all right. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry about that. I wasted a few minutes on that. All right. So uh, I had. Uh, as per my abstract, I had tried to uh, put across the fact that India has been a very keen uh, uh, actor as far as multilateral engagement is concerned, right since independence. It has been a founding member, as, had, as has been pointed out by the first speaker, uh, very clearly uh, the whole history of how India has been at the forefront and, as, and is the leading nation of the developing world where it has raised such important issues like anti-colonialism, anti-racism, the North-South debate, on the new international economic order, disarmament, anti-terrorism, and other kind of uh, issues of common concern. Uh, but the most important part with respect to my presentation here is on regarding India's contribution to UN peacekeeping. And therefore, from that, the, my uh, presentation would try to demonstrate how India has tangibly contributed in maintaining international peace and security uh, to the UN effort and how there has been a rich tradition of sending Indian peacekeepers to various UN peacekeeping missions. And India happens to be one of the leading uh, troop contributing countries, uh, uh, you know, amongst the third import, important countries, India figures at number three. 
Now, uh, the important part about understanding this consistent role that India has played with regard to contributing to UN peacekeeping is the fact that we are not looking at UN peace, peace, peacekeeping as something that has been static over time. It has really changed uh, and that really is the important and, and the crux of the matter that is, do we remain a traditional P, uh, UN peacekeeper or do we, or has the UN moved beyond that? So therefore, there has been a huge transformation that has happened in the post-Cold War period with respect to what UN peacekeeping is now considered to be. Uh, it was originally in the traditional mode meant to be a buffer, a buffer uh, playing the role of a buffer and, you know, actually being uh, a kind of monitoring of ceasefires in interstate conflicts. And then we find that there, there has been such a change over the last few decades uh, that on account of the changing nature of conflict, especially the emphasis in the post-Cold War period uh, where there has been a proliferation of, uh, you know, intrastate conflicts and that the United Nations had to be involved and, and had to, was expected to play a role there as well. There has been an enormous change in the nature of peacekeeping from being uh, the usual buffer and playing a very benign role, so to say, to becoming a complex, multidimensional, uh, uh, you know, role that the UN peacekeepers started playing. So the the what we find in the contemporary period with respect to UN UN's role in maintaining international peace and security is that it is more and more engaged in domestic conflicts, and that in the in in the present times we find that the focus is on assisting countries that are emerging from conflict to somehow transition to a peaceful state. Now, obviously, that means that there is too much on the platter when it comes to UN peacekeeping, uh, that if there is so much that is happening, then what? how do the countries cope with that? What are the mechanisms? I mean, the whole UN, uh, the, the, the peacekeeping effort at the United Nations has been institutionalized, so to say. And we are all familiar with the, with the uh, fact that the word peacekeeping doesn't even appear in the UN Charter, and yet it has been institutionalized as a major mechanism for conflict resolution or peacekeeping, etc. So in, in the light of the fact that India has been at the forefront of contributing to UN peacekeeping right from the beginning, there have been, uh, there has been a kind of, you know, effort made by, uh, by scholars uh, to, to, to uh, actually gauge the reason why India has done that. I, I don't want to emphasize and repeat the earlier presentations where it has been very uh, uh, correctly brought out that, you know, there was a natural role that India was playing as a newly emergent independent country and therefore it was at the forefront. The fact remains that as, as our own constitution says, uh, uh, the, the, uh, that we have a basic uh, uh, direction in our foreign policy towards playing a role in maintaining international peace and security. There has been in the early period a, a desire on the part of India and therefore UN peacekeeping gave India that particular platform to be able to contribute. So in a, in a direct way, in a tangible way, as I said, there, were, there has been a contribution right at the beginning. The other part is that there, there's, there has been a, an element of capability that is uh, the Indian Army stands amongst the major uh, other, uh, you know, armies of the world to, uh, as a capable force. And therefore, until the 1990s, India was one of the leading co uh, uh, countries that had a, a very, uh, you know, capable and well-led army. I'm not saying that it, it doesn't have it as, as of now. What I'm trying to say is that more competition got created in the 1990s when other countries emerged and tried to contribute to UN peacekeeping. So there's a track record that Indian peacekeepers have made over over the uh, last decades, and that has given India a certain advantage. Now, the, the fact is that if India has continued to contribute to UN peacekeeping, what is it that India gains from it? And and what I just brought out to your attention that, you know, there have been such transformations that have happened at the uh, UN peacekeeping, in the UN peacekeeping scenario, uh, 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 from the traditional to first generation to second generation, these words are, uh, are descriptions of a situation where you are doing more complex peacekeeping activities, which means you are using, you're going beyond, uh, beyond the, uh, the role of 
using force only in self defense you are using force now in the defense of the mandate and the mandate started changing in the 1990s because of the fact that un was now looking at at an element which is also described as peace building that is how do you use peacekeeping in order to move forward to you know uh, literally handhold that country so that it becomes a peaceful country and that doesn't mean that you are only there as a stabilizing force it also means that you are there to to create institutions if they are not there to do a bit of state building to do a bit of nation building these are the kind of concepts that have come within the rubric of what is described as peace building at the united nations so uh, so i would just like to point out here that such drastic and such uh, radical changes came about in the very nature of peace building that in the late 40s 50s and 60s and then you come to the uh, post cold war period the the 2000 brahimi report which spoke about you know major changes needed to be adopted that you had to have a partnership with other uh, other actors as well and that peacekeeping was not just a un effort by itself you know emanating from within un as a in terms of a, of the department of peacekeeping operations but it was a partnership with all member countries because there was a kind of a of a burden sharing that was happening so when we talk about multilateralism etc we find that this contribution of the of india in in right from its early period has been very well uh, you know presented very well uh, worked out very well uh, uh, implemented whereby india has has uh, uh, has uh, gained a kind of uh, credibility as a reliable military contributor to the united nations but then because the very nature of peacekeeping has changed over time these very countries that are contributing troops that are contributing police that are contributing civilian experts economists uh, you know all kinds of uh, uh, law, law uh, experts etc in in these missions they have to deal with situations on the ground and as the second uh, panelist in my in this panel pointed out the whole issue of terrorism the whole issue of uh, you know protection of civilians the whole issue of displacement the problems with refugees internally displaced persons the nature of internal conflict that we are now in uh, you know engaged with at the united nations means that the un peacekeepers have to take on a more active role a, more, a, a, a role in which there is going to be a greater use of force so here therefore i would just like to point out the fact that conceptually un peacekeeping has really gone through a huge change over time and the situation on the ground is all the time uh, you know the way it changes uh, it does not always facilitate the mandate to be implemented in the way it has been perceived at the un security council when those resolutions are adopted and therefore troop contributing countries like india are faced with this dilemma that 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 the training that the capacity of their troops may not be commensurate with what unfolds on the ground because it is no more restricted to doing buffer a role of keeping being a buffer or monitoring ceasefires we are into greater engagement and therefore the uh, the, the debate on on the restructuring of the un security council the, the the very manner in which we are positioning ourselves through un peacekeeping to be a, a very very apt candidate for a permanent seat in the un security council this relationship seems to be the one that has been pushed mostly in the debates that is doing peacekeeping with such a credible performance and consistently providing peacekeepers gives india an edge over other countries to be a member uh, a permanent member of the un security council now that that is what we we, we think is uh, what uh, what we deserve and this is how it needed to be pushed at the un security council because we are we, were, we are trying to uh, we we have we have demonstrated through our role but uh, but obviously whatever india has done over time maybe uh, the kind of rosy picture that i'm presenting is about how we have used peacekeeping as one of the elements of our foreign policy whereby we demonstrate that we contribute to the world body we contribute to maintaining international peace and security but the other side of it is that there have been hiccups while these complex uh, uh, operations are done and india therefore finds it difficult 
uh, uh, India is also caught in a way in a in a particular role that it has played consistently over time, which is representing the developing countries, being part of the non-aligned movement. I mean, obviously, there uh, at this juncture we may discount the relevance of the non-aligned movement, but the pressure, the moral pressure of belonging to that part, that group is still there with India, and and, and so I'll just relate that to the issue of peacekeeping by saying that when we looked at robust peacekeeping, when we looked at more use of force, when we looked at engaging uh, in, in, under Chapter 7, especially when Chapter 7 of the UN Charter was became the reference point for UN Security Council resolutions, there was, there was, there, there was going to be more uh, use of force. And at, as the second presenter mentioned the issue of responsibility to protect the R2P, which gave a kind of a moral right uh, and, an, and, and, and a right to interfere on humanitarian grounds. That also, though if it was initially sort of taken and supported, gradually India found itself distancing, distancing itself from that and took on the position that the non-aligned na nations have taken with respect to this aspect, which is that the R2P is an intrusive uh, kind of an instrument and it impinges upon the sovereignty of the states. Now, R2P obviously is an extreme uh, 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 kind of a, of a tool that was adopted for some period. But what is important is that the very nature of peace building, uh, keeping when it has changed so much and has become uh, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, bordering on larger use of force, that becomes the central point with respect to countries of the non-aligned movement, which India is obviously to uh, you know, um, beholden to and is so much a part of that, that even today India tries to say that, uh, yes, uh, we should go back to the uh, traditional uh, peacekeeping. And therefore, conceptually speaking, I would like to submit that India has not contributed to the development of peacekeeping in conceptual terms because we are still, uh, you know, holding back uh, whereas the Western countries expect India to be uh, more towards their side and to be able to, you know, take on that uh, larger role, which India is it, it doesn't feel very comfortable with. So, uh, so uh, yeah, here uh, I would like to just quickly point out a few more things that uh, I may have missed. Um, Adam, you have to. So uh, there is a okay, sir. Thank you. There is a positive image that India has uh, with respect to uh, contributing to UN peacekeeping, uh, and but there's also a negative image, as I said, that there have been some aberrations with respect to protection of women in, in certain missions in Africa. Uh, th uh, the other point is that India has not gained in, in so much in strategic and economic terms, but there have been some diplomatic advantages that accrue to India as its contribution is seen as a commitment to the world body. And as I was emphasizing, India has not able has not been able to extricate itself from the role that it has traditionally played as a leading nation in the developed world. Uh, sorry, in the developing world, uh, India prefers to remain in the traditional mode of peacekeeping through its perform, uh, though it has performed flexibly when the occasion demanded. As a true contributing country, India has represented their concerns regarding issues of control. I'm talking about the 2011 uh, uh, concept note that India presented when it was a member of the UN Security Council, the, the reference point of the debate at that point. And therefore, India uh, as a country has been uh, has been uh, demanding uh, that, you know, the true contributing countries should be part of the debate at the UN Security Council when decisions on troop deployment and uh, drawing up of the mandate uh, is done because it should keep in mind the capacity and the training of the troops. Uh, therefore, my concluding remarks are that India has traditionally been a major contributor of troops to UN peacekeeping operations and views making such contribution as, among other things, a way of securing a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. However, India is dissatisfied about the limited degree of the influence that it can currently has as a troop contributor. I think I will end with that. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Minai. That was a, a very uh, interesting presentation with a focus on what India uh, has done, but what India sh can do as well, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Now, uh, we have about uh, seven, eight minutes for our discussion, and I will uh, uh, contribute my concluding remarks time to this uh, pool of uh, time. 
uh, on the chat i have see four questions so far of which uh, i think the one raised by dr arvind gupta uh, of uh, the director of the vivekanand international foundation is uh, is a question which needs uh, uh, probably a, 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 an opportunity to respond the question mm -hmm. is was india offered permanent membership of the un security council in the mid 50s what is the correct position uh, i have in the chat replied no uh, because I have seen no record of uh, any such uh, proposal, but perhaps Ambassador Manjeev Puri, you may like to uh, throw some light uh, in replying to this question. Uh, was India offered a permanent membership? Uh, your, your audio is... Sir, thank you. I think the short answer is exactly what you said. There have been notings in different people's writings on this. I don't think there was ever any concrete proposal and I don't think that adds to our focus in trying to take things forward because I think one of the factors that many of us need to understand is the trans-Pacific relationship between the United States and China no matter that for about 20 years period there was a bit of a haters in the matter look at the way in 1971 they just took off so very quickly once again I think this is something we sitting in India are perhaps not so very familiar, not so very cogent. We should focus on ourselves, where we are going. And I think now we are taking the right steps in that direction. Again, invigorated, taking on from what we did in the decade 2005 to 2015. Thank you. Uh, there is a question on uh, how do we uh, bring about reform multi multilateralism on the ground? Uh, if uh, Dr. Rajput, could I uh, ask you from an uh, international law perspective, what would be required to uh, reform multilateralism on the ground? And by that, I mean uh, through the treaty, uh, the UN Charter, for example. Uh, how would one yes, thank yes, yes, thank you very much. Draft, making any changes to, to UN Charter is fraught with its own problems. It's as, as, as difficult as UNSC reforms, even trying to tinker with a quama in the UN Charter. So while reforming is, 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 is a good idea and treaty can be an important tool in that regard, but that's not the only tool that one can use. And there is a large role of state practice, the way countries behave. And because India is such an important player, the way India behaves in the, in the domain of international law and persuades its uh, friends in the UN to, to behave in a certain manner, that will also create a lot of, uh, say, soft law principles, which would very soon take the form of customer international law, although it's a long process to form customer international law. In any event, I think there can be very specific areas on which India can propose treaties. There are very few areas where India has proposed treaties and, and, and got them. If you look at the terrorism conventions, most of them have been proposed by UK or US basically the Western world. We do need to come right in the center, identify our areas. I think it won't be right for me to just in a few seconds to say what that those areas mm -hmm. could be. But there are a host of those areas. Terrorism is one of them. Investment protection is one of them. There are these areas where India can think of a reformed multilateral system through treaties. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to turn to a question which has come from Dhruv Jyoti Bhattacharji on uh, use of force and intervention of regional actors. And uh, 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 Dr. Minai, uh, could I ask you, uh, because you referred to this as a, as a part of the evolution of UN peacekeeping, uh, taking the recent uh, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which is what the question is uh, about, uh, how do you see the UN responding to uh, uh, using peacekeeping in regional uh, conflicts. Does it require consent of parties or can the UN go by itself? How do you see it evolving in, in the year 2020? Your audio is muted. Chapter 8 of the UN Charter provides for regional organizations. So uh, in 2010, there has been a non-paper uh, from uh, the Department of Peacekeeping and the Department of Field Support, where they were looking at, uh, you know, the, the the issue of partnership. That is, uh, looking at peacekeeping as a partnership, uh, you know, kind of an uh, endeavor. And therefore, regional organizations are 
you know they come within the framework of multilateral institutions as well so the burden sharing is in any way part of the provisions of the un charter itself and uh, uh, we, since we are focusing on un peacekeeping we have not looked at the uh, at the uh, uh, contributions that have been made by nato and other regional organizations in africa etc so there is any way a parallel uh, uh, you know peacekeeping going on with respect to uh, regional organizations taking the lead and uh, and there is also uh, at the united nations because it takes almost up to 6 months to put together the forces and get them deployed there has been a tendency to depend upon regional organizations to first get into the act you know to because they are there physically so so the un actually depends on regional organizations where it is possible for them to come forward and fill in the time they they are the ones in the forefront and then the un takes up uh, once the uh, mandate has come and the forces are in place thank you madam and uh, the last question which and i'll club two questions and request ambassador manjeet puri to respond is uh, one is asked by fazur rahman siddiqui regarding uh permanent members and uh, what extra efforts are uh, are to be done uh, in terms of un reform to actually change the nature of uh, permanent members which is uh, probably similar to maninder pal singh's question on is there a criteria for permanent membership and should there be a standard that should actually de facto qualify uh, member states to become permanent members so manji uh, the point here is Uh, what is the characteristic of a permanent member in the year 2020 uh, how do you see uh, yeah sir thank you uh, very much for this i wish we could lay down some absolute standards and then know what we need to strive for but this is a political body and in a political body and in a political world the name of the game has to be able to be able to get ahead politically i think we should not lose sight of this so has india all the attributes the answer is yes one of the five largest economies in the world today which we were not in 1945 1947 etc let us look at the fact that three of the p5 are not members of the top 5 gdp club but certainly another one who is not there is certainly part of the most advanced militaries club so in sep several ways things get clubbed together but fundamentally this is a political thing and we need to work on this politically uh the underlying questions here that we are asked is how are things going to move forward my answer is we need to follow two parallel tracks we must keep the water hot at the un i e the ign those processes must be kept on so that there is involvement there is global interest in the matter and the large un membership keeps itself engaged with the matter and feeling that they have a sense of being a proprietary to this particular thing simultaneously you need to engage with the largest and the most important in the world perhaps the g20 is the best particular forum there and then try and take things forward in a sense sir am i not taking you back to 1944 45 yes. the four policemen and then the san francisco conference that's the way it's going to happen you need to be active and you need to remember there's no place for either feeling it can't be done or not to be willing to accept the best that you can get for yourself it thank will you. happen thank you ji and uh, the, i i think uh, i would on behalf of all participants like to thank our distinguished panelists they have made uh, some very very interesting presentations the takeaways for me uh, from manjeev your presentation is that we need to uh, activate and uh, keep uh, alive the political determination and commitment and also be realistic and and and, and look at incremental progress because as long as we are on the right track and i think that was a very important message Dr Rajput I think your uh, approach of uh, using international law to enable or disable I think that is a very very uh, interesting framework and uh, the examples that you have given including the comprehensive convention on international terrorism I think uh, uh, the audience and on behalf of them I would like to thank you for uh, you know focusing us on what is it in it for India and that that is the theme of our session and I think that uh, how can we either push a provisions to enable or disable uh, provisions of international law or proposed provisions of international law to meet our own interests 
And uh, Madam uh, 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 Minai, uh, Dr. Dr. Minai, I would like to thank you for actually drawing attention to one aspect which is common to all the three presentations and to our theme today, which is that uh, the, the, the need for India to actually contribute to the conceptualization, to the ideas. You mentioned peacekeeping, but I would expand it to the entire agenda of the United Nations. And I think that that is what we are uh, right now seeing. Uh, I, I, as I said in, in, in my opening remarks, I was struck by the three addresses of our Prime Minister this year at the United Nations. In uh, my recent memory, I have not seen this kind of sustained uh, high-profile activism at the world stage by the Prime Minister of India before. And I think that this sets the, the ground for the foot soldiers, uh, whether they are in India or they are in the United Nations system, to, uh, to, uh, to contribute to creating the conceptual framework, which is what uh, will make the UN relevant and reform it to make it uh, relevant for the 21st century. With these uh, words, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I thank you very much. I would like to uh, bring this session uh, to a close and hand over uh, the microphone back to Deepika. Deepika, please take over. Thank you. I think uh, you will agree we've done a good thank job. You. Thank you, Ambassador Mukherjee, for ending the session almost you, on time. Um, now we'll take a break for 45 minutes and then we'll begin the second session on India and international financial trading institutions and arrangements at 11.45. Thank you. Thank you.